cute titles, and then it's all downhill. After <laughs> <laughs> today, today we're going to start collecting for the Christmas my, uh, thing. My wife, who's an, who's an English prof, and uh, daughters are horrified by all that stuff. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's surely good to be back with you all. My goodness, it's been, uh, well, a little longer than, than before. I actually was engaged in one of these interim pastorates that lasted uh, longer than I anticipated, but uh, uh, about a year or so. But uh, it's great to be back with you. Um, I think you've uh, spent a little time with my colleague and friend, uh, Mark Biddle, who's been here. Uh, yeah, we sort of, uh, we tag team on a course and uh, uh, talk to each other pretty regularly, and I know you enjoyed him, but we really just appreciate this opportunity to share. This is, uh, the class is bigger than, you all just keep growing. Uh, I, I uh, then I remember from a year or so ago, I ran off 35 copies, which is not quite enough, so uh, some of you may need to share a bit. It's just a front and back page that will help with the outline, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, the, um, uh, the brief that I was given by Carolyn was to do something uh, Christmassy. I'm still not quite there in the spirit. Uh, uh, Thanksgiving was recent, and uh, um, I'm one of these that's a little slow to warm up to the, the Christmas season and Christmas music and whatnot. But uh, it's good to go ahead and dive in. And so the next three weeks, we're starting Advent, um, we'll be dealing with, um, yeah, I just had a playing with this, um, the first Noels um, that we actually have in the gospel material, uh, the, the first Christmas stories. And uh, my main concern, and uh, it was in the little description that I gave, and I printed it at the top of the, uh, of the paper there, and I think it's been in, in some of the promotional material, uh, is uh, it may seem that, that uh, my purpose is to sort of uh, uh, ruin the Christmas tradition, but, uh, but that's, that's not really my purpose. Uh, I, I do want, however, to uh, adjust our visions of nativity scenes and creches just a little bit, which doesn't mean please don't go, you know, dismantling everything you've collected through the years. You probably have things set up through the church. That's fine. Okay. Uh, but in fact, we have tended through the generations, and we do it at our house too, is you just sort of throw everything you can into the nativity scene. Um, I, well, you know, you know what? It's a little hard to have two or three scenes, although if I had my druthers, we'd have a little Matthew scene and a little Luke scene. <laughs> uh, but alas, the world does not, not work the way I want to. But, and, and it's fine, but we do tend to sort of, you know, you get the angels in there, and oh, we do nativity plays. I've been doing Christmas pageants since I was a kid. And, uh, you know, did the shepherd thing and then was a wise man and all this. Uh, played Joseph a time or two. Uh, you know, again, we just sort of throw it all in there. The manger, the, uh, and we add animals, of course, but that, that's fine. Uh, uh, you know, some sort of sheep, goats, camels, <laughs> uh, wise men, uh, angels, manger, Mary, Joseph, um, all of that together in kind of one nice, lovely scene. And that's fine of course, for decorative and artistic purposes. But in fact, uh, the stories that came down to us uh, from the Gospels, primarily Matthew and Luke, present same Jesus being born, of course, Mary and Joseph, but they present, as they do in reporting about Jesus generally, their own particular perspectives on things. And in fact, there is not a lot of overlap between them. There are no angels in Matthew. Well, there's one that pops up in Joseph's dream, but it's not quite the same. No singing angels. Okay. Uh, no shepherds. Okay. Uh, in Luke, there's no wise men. No Herod and all of that. And there's no manger in Matthew. How could he tell a story without a way in a manger? Uh, now, you, you, you know, it's in Bethlehem. There's wonderful stuff there. But any storyteller selects certain things, um, certain details and whatnot. And before we sort of harmonize and put it all together, it's really very useful to let each scene be what it is. Let Matthew be Matthew, let Luke be Luke. We're going to do Matthew today and then Luke next time. And then talk about the other Gospels that don't have any birth scene at all. How do you tell the story of Jesus without telling the birth of Jesus? Well, Mark and John did a pretty good job. We'll talk about that the third week. <laughs> but, uh, but letting each Gospel be distinctive, not just to sort of, okay, let's be technically correct and not mix our stories, uh, but also that there's a thematic purpose involved. Um, 
naturally, in both Matthew and Luke, they open their Gospels with birth stories. That's a good, good way to start a story of someone uh, with the birth of this very important figure uh, that they call Savior and Lord, that we call Savior and Lord. Uh, but however you start a narrative, and the Gospels, whatever else they are, are narratives, uh, and they're very artistic, they have a good bit of design to them, but beginnings tend to portend what is to follow. Uh, motifs are developed, details are presented, themes are highlighted uh, that are meant to be, if you will, previews of coming attractions within the Gospel. So these are not just, ah, oh, well, we've got to start with the birth because we've got to get Jesus on the scene, and then we get down to business. No, no, this is, Matthew and Luke are down to business from the very beginning. And in the telling of how Jesus was born and the events and circumstances around it, they are alerting us to very important themes that will help us read the entire story. Uh, so if we just kind of import elements from all over the place, we can miss that. So what we're going to do is just look at Matthew distinctively today, and we're going to try to keep Luke out of it. Uh, next week, we're going to flip and, and do the opposite thing. Not that all of these details are not wonderful, but seeing them in their particular context. All right? So let's start with this, with Matthew. Uh, Matthew 1 and 2, it's a lot of material, the first two chapters. And I've just highlighted some of it here. Uh, and we'll be reading bits and pieces, but a lot of this is familiar to you. But maybe the focus on particular things. Notice the main points of the outline. Matthew gives us a whole lot of Joseph. Um, and not much Mary, which is kind of interesting. Uh, I mean, Mary plays a rather important role, to put it mildly. But um, Matthew is going to focus on Joseph a little bit more. Luke is going to flip that completely. Uh, Luke is all about Mary. Ju Joseph, you know, barely makes it on the stage. Uh, and he's not, you know, not really that important anyway. Uh, but, uh, and often I've noticed in nativity scenes and Christmas plays, if you get the Joseph role, it's not a very <laughs> just kind of like, eh, you know, he's sort of, you know, we, he's been a shepherd the last three years, you know, it's kind of like, you, know, you can't make him, you know, after a while, the, you know, the bathrooms and the towels just kind of wear out with the shepherd thing, so let's put him in on the Joseph thing, you know, you just kind of stand there for a while, uh, but no, uh, Matthew actually gives us some Joseph stuff, uh, so I sort of called it the Joseph solo, then, very important theme, and you'll know this, the whole Emmanuel thing, my actual favorite contemporary uh, Christmas carol is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Uh, and only Matthew gives us this Emmanuel theme. Um, and it's actually in connection with Joseph. And then we have the Magi trio. Um, we don't actually know that there are three of them, but we'll just stay with that for, for now. Uh, there are three gifts, but we don't exactly know how many there were. Uh, and, uh, you know, we three kings of Orient are and all of that. Uh, we'll get to that, but those are sort of our, our three main things. And all of these are unique to Matthew. You'll not find this in Luke. So we're going to sort of focus on that. Let's start with Joseph, shall we? Uh, Joseph is introduced... Um, as the sort of first main character after a long genealogy, the last 17 verses to open Matthew, with every name you can think of from the Old Testament. I'm going to come back to that in just a second, but then when the story actually gets uh, underway, uh, Joseph is introduced, and let me just read these uh, familiar a few verses. Now the birth of Jesus, this is in verse 18, the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together... All of that is very important detail here, and rather, uh, uh, rather chastely discussed, but you, you've got the picture. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Well, we know that. Uh, that was not Joseph's first thought. Uh, right, you know, when Mary becomes pregnant, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> I, I, I just knew it. I just knew it was special when we started dating. And, uh, and, 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 now, and now you've become pregnant, and it must be. It's not me. It must be that the Holy Spirit has done this, and the Messiah has come. Yeah, again, again, we're sort of familiar with that. That was not the first or 100th thought of Joseph or anybody else at the time. Right. And that's not because, oh, everybody loves a scandal. No, you just, this was not normal sort of stuff. Um, and we need to appreciate that. We can have some fun with it, but we need to appreciate it more than we often do. Verse 19, her husband Joseph, 
being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and explained things. But let's just stop there. Starting with, first of all, as you see from the outline, it's a very important little description. It seems kind of like just a, a passing thing. But it's actually very important for Matthew. Joseph is introduced here, <coughs> Mary somewhat in passing at this point, but the focus is on how Joseph is going to respond. And notice he's identified as a righteous man. And we go, well, yeah, fine. He's a good guy. Um, lots of Bible folks are good guys, not all of them. Yeah, but this is, this is a term that's very important to Matthew. It's the Greek term dikaios. And there, uh, there's a verb form and a noun and an adjective form. Um, and uh, this is arguably one of the top themes that Matthew does develop. This is the first character to be so identified. But Matthew, in the teaching of Jesus that follows, certainly in the person of Jesus, and in just a variety of ways we don't have time to go into, but righteousness, being righteous and doing righteously is a huge Matthew theme. And so this is not just a little sort of throwaway. Uh, this is what Matthew, at least one of his main purposes in writing this gospel, is to promote righteousness. Um, and that term is kind of one of those, yeah, it's a good religious term, and, you know, we, it's kind of it's being good or something. A, a little bit more specific than that, uh, and particularly from Matthew's perspective. Uh, it's actually a little different than how Paul uses the term. Uh, but Matthew presents it as, it, it, really, it really is focusing on doing the right thing. Righteousness, doing the right thing. But it starts with discerning the right thing, which is not always that easy to do. Uh, well, right from wrong, isn't that clear? Well, I wish it were all the time. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Uh, and for the people of God, it can be very complex sometimes in a very complex, difficult world that we live in. So it's, first of all, discerning that. Well, what exactly is the right path to go? Uh, God's given a lot of guidance in God's Word. Uh, from Joseph's perspective, of course, we would refer to the Old Testament. He had the law and all this. Yeah, and he's thinking about that. But you can't just, uh, well, some try, but I, I, wish, I wish they wouldn't try so hard. Uh, in every ethical issue that comes up, well, let's just find a verse in the Bible to slap on it. Uh, we have this problem, so, you know, so sort of punch in Bible verses and outcomes. This is exactly what we're supposed to do. Actually, the further I go in biblical study, uh, the more questions I often have and the more difficult it can be to discern precisely what the right thing to do is. So it, it, there's that discernment process. And then for Matthew, it's very much not just, okay, you know, so I stand for the right thing, I know what it is, I'm going to shout it on the rooftops and all this. Matthew could care less about that. Once you discern what is right, you do it. You put it into practice. Which is such a basic thing, but we all often kind of stop short of that. <coughs> Matthew just hammers that again and again. At the end of the famous Sermon on the Mount, that's the first big block of teaching in Matthew's Gospel at the end of chapter 7. After Jesus has gone on and on teaching a whole variety of things about what is right to do, he says, look, it's that famous little story of you build either on a rock foundation or on a sand foundation. Uh, building on a rock foundation is the only thing that will stand up during a storm. And what does it mean to build on a rock foundation? Well, Jesus says, I've just taught you all this stuff. The foundation that is solid is if you do and put into practice. Uh, not if you pass the test and answer all the right questions about, yes, I've got all, I understand all that teaching. Jesus. It's about putting into practice. So discerning and doing. Very important all throughout Matthew. And Joseph is sort of the first example of this. Uh, and he's a tough example. And this is not the, the only time that Matthew's going to do this. This whole idea of discernment and doing, it often takes a great deal of courage to do the right thing that you know to do, particularly because of difficulties. Uh, the world is not always ready to uh, uh, receive our right action or to respond in the kind of way that we would like. Uh, well, Joseph finds himself in the middle of a really difficult situation. Now, we've already laughed about it a little bit. <coughs> Joseph wasn't, uh, wasn't having any fun. <laughs> he was engaged to Mary. Uh, and as you probably know and have heard, or betrothed is the, is this term we use, um, engagement is, uh, you know, in, in our day is, uh, well, it depends on who you are. Mar marital customs, I find, are, are changing. 
Uh, I have two, two daughters in their <laughs> mid-20s. <laughs> uh, lo lovely young women, and, uh, uh, and we're very close, and I understand about 40% of what they think. Uh, and and they, they understand none of what I think. But, uh, one is married. Uh, oh, I mean, she is. Uh, I, 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 we don't need to go there. Uh, and and the, other one, the other one's much more traditional. Anyway, you know, customs change, there's the point. But betrothal or engagement in the ancient world was a very binding arrangement. All right, there was a, usually a year or so before the consummation and the final wedding and all this, but it was binding. So to get out of that, if you wanted to, you know, oh, well, I broke off my engagement with him. He didn't, or, uh, no, it, to break off an engagement at this time was tantamount to divorce. Uh, and also, the standards during the engagement period is as if you're married, you're not to sleep with anyone else. All right, there, there's to be absolute faithfulness and dire consequences for not following through that. Uh, namely, divorce and, oh, well, it could get worse than that. And so we have this situation where the betrothed, the beloved Mary, winds up pregnant, but not by Joseph. And it's like, wow, okay, he knows something has gone on. We don't have any details about what he was thinking, but one might imagine the possibilities. Uh, again, joked before, but no one would just jump on. Um, oh, wow, we've been praying for the Messiah, and now this is it. <laughs> yeah, we've been waiting for the Virgin to, to finally be the right one. No, 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 that, that just, just wasn't in anyone's thought uh, at, at the time at all. And Joseph realizes, <laughs> man, uh, you know, he's a righteous man. Okay? He wants to do the right thing. In the eyes of God, in the eyes of his community, he wants to do the right thing according to the law, and he wants to do the right thing by Mary. And that's not really easy to figure out, and we need to, to appreciate that. Uh, it really becomes, I've sort of put it there on the outline, is that he's <coughs> having to negotiate between law, which is a big part of being righteous, and love. Uh, but actually, before we get to the negotiation, that those two things really go very much together. In fact, in biblical thought, and Jesus is going to reinforce that, the law is all about love. In fact, it is a law of love. We often kind of, kind of too quickly, I think, act like oh, there's love on one side and then this, this harsh law. In Jewish thought, no, no, no. Law is all about love. And in fact, Jesus is going to be in Matthew 22, but the other Gospels have it as well. Remember when the scribe asked him, what are the two, you know, what's the greatest commandment? Uh, we know there's all the Torah there, and what again, we would call the Old Testament. Can, can you sort of boil it down? Jesus says, you bet. Love God with everything you've got, heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you take care of those, and by the way, he's just quoting from the law in those two statements, one from Deuteronomy, one from Leviticus. If you do the love thing toward God and toward one another, you're going to keep the law if you're really serious about it. So, so that they very much go together always have in Jewish thought, but still, when it gets down to the nitty-gritty of particulars, it's not always easy to see how we keep the law and do the loving thing. That should always be the goal, and Joseph is wrestling with this. But if you go by the strict law, um, what do you do with a betrothed young woman who clearly is not a virgin anymore, at least according to the way you would normally think, uh, this would be Mary accepted for the moment, but what Joseph is thinking, well, she's been unfaithful or something. Uh, there could even be a situation of maybe she was taken advantage of, but in any case, she is, according to this society, now damaged goods, and so the marriage should be broken off at this point, but there's this nasty little law in Deuteronomy 22. We don't know how often it was put into practice, I hope not very often and have a hunch not very often, but it's still there that says basically a woman in this position, um, the men of the city were to take her out and stone her to death. And there was that, that particular feature. There. There's a lot of other aspects. If you want to read all the details uh, about uh, marital law and unfaithfulness and such, read Deuteronomy 22. It's got some interesting little connections and such. But still, there are a couple of verses where, you know, wow, am I going to say, you know, Mary? And she's going to be showing anyway. There's going to have to be some explanation. Yeah, 
And here we are in Nazareth. Um, I'm sorry, but this is disgraceful. She's been a disgrace to me, to our town. So are we going to follow the law and be righteous and do that? Um, but then he loves Mary. Now, you know, and I don't know. We don't need to even go with the sort of, you know, that he was mushy romantically. Oh, you know, I don't know. It may have been an arranged marriage. But still, there was a sense that he respected her. Okay? He loved her as a person and certainly didn't want to put her through all of that, put himself through that. So he's got himself a real struggle here between law and love. And he's having to face that, thinks through it, and then, a little, little phrase, he resolves then to do something. Uh, again, we just have two or three verses, but they, they go so quickly, but, it, but it, it, uh, you can just imagine the, the consternation and the... Uh, the agony and the thinking through, and then he comes to a decision that's the best he can do, and sometimes that's all we can do. It's a compromise. He's going to divorce her. That seems to, he can't seem to get around that, but do it privately. Certainly without the big stoning thing, without making a big public disgrace. That's not a great situation, but that's, that's the best he can come up with. Now, he, of course, doesn't have to go through that, but I think we need to pause just for a second and see that embedded in Matthew's story is actually a very complex ethical case that can apply to all sorts of things. Finding out the right thing to do, oh, but it's going to affect someone. I mean, most everything we do, and the whole realm of ethics is not just about, now I need to do this or that, and it's just, just me involved. No, it's almost never just us involved. Uh, others are affected, not least those who are close to us. So what I do that is right, well, how's it going to affect this person? Well, if it's right, it's right. Yeah, <laughs> but is it so right that I can just not care about the effects on others? Um, you know, we could tease this out a long time. Fortunately, Joseph doesn't have to keep teasing it out. Uh, he gets a dream to help settle this. I wish this would settle all of my ethical concerns. <laughs> um, and I, I, I mean, I, I, tend, I sleep regularly every night and, and actually tend to take naps now and again. Uh, and, uh, and I'm a big dreamer. Woohoo! Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, so, so God, you know, now, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a student of the Bible, you know, I, I got all, but sometimes it just doesn't all compute, does it? So, Lord, how about a special word? And a dream would be fine. I spend a lot of time sleeping, so why don't we do that? Uh, and then I wake up and there you go. I, you know, tell my wife, honey, I know what we're supposed to do now. Because <laughs> I had a dream. And she says, you dream all the damn time. And say, yeah, you eat late at night. And uh, spicy food. And we, we're just not, no, no, no. We, we're just not going to, your dreams I'm going to trust about as much as that doorknob. Uh, you know, your dreams can be kind, even dreams. Okay, now, the angel of the Lord appears, okay, and says, ah, this, it's all right, Joseph. Uh, she's conceived by the Holy Spirit. Yes, you didn't think of that, did you? But no, this, this is unique. She conceived by the Holy Spirit, and the Messiah is coming. And of course, we all know this. And Joseph wakes up and just, ah, yay. Okay. Well, again, it's very sparsely told, but I don't think it's as simple as that. I love the, again, the, the just bare factness of the conclusion, but it also conceals a lot. Uh, in verse 24, when Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took her as his wife. Okay, again, righteous man. Once it was discerned, and it changed his plans, by the way. He was willing to change his plans. That's useful. No, I resolved, I studied, I'm sorry, I'm not, no, no. You mean now? Okay, oh, wow. And in a very unusual situation, took her as his wife, and had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son. And uh, he named him Jesus, because the angel could also given the name in the dream. So he, he was just simply following through. So Joseph obeyed. Has a dream, angel appears today. Yes, but I still want to argue for the fact that even dreams require discernment. Joseph had to work through that. Was that, was that the angel of the Lord? Okay. Again, just because someone identifies themselves as an angel of the Lord in your dream, unless you dream in much more specific ways than I do uh, and have a lot closer relationship with the Lord than I do uh, just because some angel appears in your dream I don't know but okay no I see so there, there's a discernment there but also when Joseph wakes up he did not have every question answered okay I'm going to say the same thing about Mary next week 
because Mary's going to have an angelic visit and all this. But we tend to think, you know, because Mary, probably 12, 13 years of age. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the Messiah. Yeah. Every, every young girl's dream. How about that? You know? And, uh, and you know, I said, uh, my life, and all women are going to, not all women, everybody's going to call me blessed. Well, isn't that nice? Yeah. But it's, come on. Okay? This is, there's a lot, and I'm getting into next week too much, but that Mary has to, and you'll recognize this term, because it's, Mary has to ponder. This is, <laughs> her life's being turned upside down, but she's having the Messiah. Yeah, yeah, to try, you know, I mean, I raised, tried to raise two normal kids. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know, I mean, you know, with, 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 you know that, that happened in all the sort of right, normal ways. I mean, you know, oh, raising the Messiah? What, I don't know, what the, how do you do that? Um, and at age 12, remember that little incident? Uh, that's only in Luke, by the way, uh, when Jesus just decides to stay behind and, you know, drive his parents crazy. Because, you know, uh, I mean, we can all get, get, get ahead of myself a bit. But, but get, with Joseph, now this oh, still a lot to work out what this is going to mean, what the town's going to say. And it takes courage to simply obey and take her as his wife and take on this burden of being father. Ah, but, this is the next point briefly, adopted father, stepfather. Okay, I mean, obvious who the, the real father is. This is God's son. Uh, the Holy Spirit is going to be the one who, who generates conception within Mary's womb. Uh, so Joseph doesn't have a thing to do with it uh, biologically, but he is brought in and brought in by the angel of the Lord into this now kind of unique, should we say, blended family situation um, as the adopted father. Okay, well, that, that's all right. Uh, yeah, but I want, I want to pause there just for a second. Because, um, again, we tend not to think about Joseph so much, and I'm not trying to make him some superhero. He's, I think, just a very ordinary guy. But he does take on, and I'm going to use the phrase, uh, he's going to take on the burden. And there is some burden here. Uh, now, as I'll say next week, Mary, it's nothing quite like the burden that Mary takes on, but we're just with Joseph. Now, he's, he's, he's going to be willing to enter into this. Uh, he doesn't know where all it's going to take him. And on the other side, if I may say it this way, God is also willing to partner with Joseph, in a sense. Um, now they're not remotely on the same level, but, 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 but there's something fascinating, and I, I'm here now not just drawing on Matthew, but the little broader New Testament tradition in particular. Um, it, it's hit me over the last few years. There's something about adoption that's, that's actually a very profound theological concept. Paul develops it uh, probably more explicitly than anyone, but the basic thing is, I mean, we are all children of God. We are all sons and daughters of God by adoption. Okay, Jesus obviously is son of God in a more essential way, in that mysterious way that's involved in the Trinity. But, uh, you know, Paul has this incredible statement that we're, we're fully heirs with Jesus, joint heirs with Christ. We, we're not, and it's not, it's not adoption as, well, okay, we'll kind of, kind of let you all in the back door of the family. No, I mean, it, it's, it's full privilege. Adoption does not mean um, second-class citizenship at all. Uh, and actually, I, I, uh, as I just talk to people in churches and such through the years, um, people will come up to me and say, oh, yeah, I, I don't know if you knew this, but, but you know, my, this is my adopted son or daughter. And uh, you, know, you would have never known it, and they're just as, as full a member of the family as anyone else. So, I mean, we have that idea in our mind, but when we apply it, to Jesus as Son of God, and we are children of God. And now, you know, Joseph is brought into this adoptive thing. But, but it really is an incredible idea of how God is willing to, if I may put it this way, open his intimate family, Father, Son, and Spirit, to include us in the circle. 
when we talk about the family of God and brothers, I mean, we would use that kind of language. It's it's really quite quite breathtaking. And and Joseph is actually already a a part of that just by by being brought in. And and I think we tend to say, well, yeah, someone's got to kind of come in and, you know, um, be, quote, the breadwinner and kind of protect young Mary and all this. But, you know, but I think it's more than that. I think Joseph really is playing a role of showing you know, why exactly is God coming to earth in a human being? Well, to relate to the human family. Uh, the language here in Matthew is you call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Because the human family, we are all flawed. And we need God to come to us in a more personal way to be one of us, to be with us, to live for us, to die for us. Uh, in order to incorporate us more fully. And, and all of that is by adoption, and it's a wonderful thing. Now, I'm going on a little bit about this because it also helps me make sense of the first 17 verses before this that baffle students and uh, what can baffle anyone. It just doesn't seem the most interesting way to start, start a story because you've got 17 verses of genealogy. So and so begat so and so begat so and so. I mean, you got yeah, Jehoshaphat's in there, yay. Uh, Zerubbabel's in there. You know, got all these unpronounceable names. You use a, you know, all this lineup, and then okay, and then Jesus comes. So it's kind of like I mean, we sort of think, well, that's kind of a Jewish thing. You got to do the whole genealogy. Fine, 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 fine. Get that over with. Now let's get on to the story where we were in verse 18. Yeah, but that genealogy, the more I look at it, and, and a number of scholars have done this, is just, that's not just a sort of throwaway, boring list of names. In fact, it starts just verse 1, is an account of the genealogy of Jesus Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then we get 17 verses of going from Abraham through David, and then eventually to Joseph. So this whole, oh, son of Abraham, son of David, now that feels, it's kind of getting Jesus' genealogy in order in the line of the covenant-making God. God made covenant with Abraham and with David, and now this special new covenant is coming through Christ. Yeah, we get that. But what's interesting, and students always ask this eventually, at least the sharp ones do, uh, they say, well, this this is all great. And we see this of son of Abraham, son of David, and there's lots of fun things that Matthew does with the genealogy. He uses numbers and clever ways and such to show that, oh, Jesus is in this line. But they go, excuse me, okay, this, this is Joseph's genealogy. And it is. Okay, the house of David and all of this sort of thing. Now, Mary may have been a part of the sort of larger family line, but no, but this is, these are Joseph's uh, uh, papa's and mama's, he actually has four of them. Yeah, it's sort of like, you know, that, that doesn't work. Okay, they, you know, we all know about DNA and genes and all this sort of stuff. You know, Joseph had nothing to do with producing the human Jesus, so why do we care about the genealogy? Why does Matthew care about it? Okay, well, it's not that Matthew didn't know that. Okay, in fact, Matthew is the one who tells us that Joseph is not the father. So why all this genealogy? I think it is all about this adoption thing again. This is the family of Jesus. No, it's the adopted. That's fine. Okay, we're all adopted into God's family, and this is part of stressing the breadth and inclusiveness of Jesus's outreach to the human condition. He doesn't just come for one particular family or just one particular people. It's this connection to Abraham. Now that's good, and David. Yet, but but not just that. It's to, to all the people that go back through generations after generation after generation. And and Matthew particularly, let me say more about this later, but at the end of his genealogy, the way he divides it up, he divides it into three periods of 14. I think he's fudging the numbers just a little bit, but it it makes for a cool cool design. And basically, it's all structured on um, what has happened before and since. Now, my version says the deportation. The term I tend to use more is the exile. The exile in Babylon, 14 generations before and then 14 generations after. And Matthew is basically telling a story, you know, as a people, we have spent most of our time, despite all the promise of the land, we spend most of our time in exile, somewhere else, ruled by some other kind of people. And when Matthew writes, Matthew is writing when the Jews are under Roman rule, 
Uh, this has been the long history for, for a long time. Abraham himself didn't really get to spend much time in the promised land. He only owned a little piece of it. There's always that hope and such, but we have been a people who have wandered, who have suffered in exile. And I think through this genealogy, and there's other things going on here, but, but Matthew is saying God has been with us during all of that wandering, and Jesus the Messiah comes in solidarity with that, he is with us in exile and has come to, as it were, bring us home again. Uh, it's a solidarity with adopted family, with wandering people, with those on the edge and on the margins. Now, I wish we had time to develop this, but uh, we, we need to move on. You do need to notice, if you haven't before, just in the opening verses of the genealogy, there are four women listed. I don't know if you've, if you've ever thought about this. It's, it's quite fascinating. That's not typical in Jewish genealogies. Uh, it's kind of humorous in that all the men are begatting all the other men. And as far as I know, no man has begatted anybody. But, uh, but, it, but that's kind of how the line goes. It's a patrilineal line. But four, four mothers or four mamas are just sort of thrown in. Just, and not all the mothers are listed. Well, five with Mary. Okay? But uh, it's Tamar, Ruth, uh, Rahab, and then named, not named, but we all know who the name is, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, <laughs> who was married to David. Okay, which is really quite, and there's so much going on. Okay, son of David, we like that. But you know, this is kind of like Matthew's going through the family album here. So, oh, here, here, look, look at all you, you know, he, you, you don't, there's some, some things you don't need to point out. You know, you just kind of, okay, well, let's go over that. No, Matthew actually says, you know what, look, Johnny or Jacob or whatever. But look, yeah, we're talking, look at the genealogy and oh, King David, you know. But the line that Joseph comes through was when, when King David took somebody else's wife, committed adultery with her. Oh, and then murdered her husband too. <laughs> I just thought you might want to know that. Okay, and then let's keep it. No, it, 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 it's incredible. Now, not Bathsheba's fault, name. Uh, at all. It's really, I mean, it's a blight on David's record if you go back and read the story. And then, I guess I almost like this little bit, it's just to, uh, Tamar, if you haven't read the story of Tamar in Genesis 38, it doesn't make the big Sunday school circuit <laughs> typically, but it's a, a wonderful story. Uh, she, well, I, I just can't, I can't go into it without just 10 minutes, but it, it's, it's a little wild. It's a little crazy. Okay, and then Rahab, okay, just the Bible. Oh, Rahab, the prostitute. Oh, look, look, Johnny. We got here. Great, 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 great grandma. She was a prostitute. And uh, you know, but again, yeah, but Matthew doesn't care about that, and neither does Joshua, by the way, because she was a righteous woman who put her faith into action by hiding the spies and all that. Just the prostitute thing, just, just sort of one of those things. Story of Ruth is a little interesting in its own way. Anyway, uh, one thing about all four women, most scholars suggest they all are Gentiles or have Gentile connections. So it shows that this is not, again, in this great adoptive family, it's not just for Jews. Uh, there's a, already a more of a global aspect. The book of Ruth, of course, Ruth the Moabite is brought in. Your people will be my people, all of that. Uh, but then there's also, should we say, irregular circumstances associated with all four of those women and the men that they are involved with. And it's not the women who are the problems. Okay, but it is family life. It, it really is showing the messy parts of the family album. The human condition doesn't always go down perfectly, does it? Boy meets girl, 2.2 kids, you know, 2.2 camels in the garage or whatever. <laughs> uh, you know, okay, it, it's, yeah, and there are lots of stuff. But Jesus comes for all of us. That's the adopted family that he says, yes, you're my people. <laughs> DNA, biology, blood. No, no, you're, you're, you're my people. We, we're where we're wanting this thing. I've come to save you. I've come to restore you in exile. All right. With that, uh, let's move on to the second thing. I've spent uh, a little bit more time with that, but actually it leads into the next point, the famous Emmanuel thing. And I'll go over this a little bit more quickly. We have till 45. Is that right, 1045? Okay, and I've got 1030 right on the note. So I know you all have, have things to do. Uh, Emmanuel... Um, this is, well, let me just read the, the verses real quickly. Again, Matthew's the only one who presents it. This is part of the whole dream thing. Uh, the angel uh, says, She will bear a son. Your name of Jesus. He will save his, uh, save his people from their sins. 
Uh, all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. This would be the prophet Isaiah. Look, the virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which is a Hebrew term. Now, Matthew's writing in Greek, but he just carries that over. Emmanuel, and of course, we know this, but um, not everyone would have uh, spoken Hebrew at this time, since Matthew's writing in Greek. It means what? It means literally, God with us. Emmanuel. Im uh, is, or Ima is uh, with. Uh, the new part is uh, us, and El is God. So sort of with us, God. God is with us. Uh, this is not Jesus' given name, but it is his functional name. It tells us in just beautiful ways, simple but also profound, in Jesus, God has come to be with us as never before. And I, the, the presence of God has been with God's people forever. All right? God created the world, and God didn't then just abandon the world, but God has been present um, Adam and Eve wishes God weren't so present, <laughs> uh, walking in the garden and all of that. But uh, you know, the presence of God is such a profound um, theological concept throughout the Bible, not just a distant, uh, deistic kind of God up there who spun the top and then just kind of watches and sees what goes on, but no, a God who's engaged, who's involved, who is with us. So this is not new, except it's new in the sense that God's never been with us like this. God with us, actually as one of us. That's pretty with us. <laughs> that, that's, I mean, as a human being, fully a human being, also fully divine. Now, I'm theologizing a little bit beyond Matthew's language, but in, in classical theological terms. But fully human with us, um, feel what we feel, experience what we experience and qualified like none other to save us because he became one of us. That, that's, that's profound stuff. O come, O come, Emmanuel. But there's an interesting history of this. And I don't want to spend a lot of time with this. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. But uh, I, I sort of, I've outlined it, well, one, two, three, four on your sheet. And then this little chart maybe can help a little bit. I just want to get us a feel, and I've already talked about this some, but this, the fact that this is fulfilling what Isaiah said. Uh, talks, it, it, it plugs us into a, to a whole process of God being with us. Now, we focus on the moment, on this moment that Matthew is talking about here, and that there is a uniqueness to that moment, but it's also part of a, of a full sweep of how God has been working. Starting with, just in this particular context, this is quoting from Isaiah. As you probably know, Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah wrote in the 8th century B.C., or B.C.E., as we typically say it these days. Uh, he's writing in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big part of what we call the Old Testament. And uh, there's a particular context that he is writing in. Uh, one thing that, uh, and, and, and I deal with this with students all the time and still struggle with the best way to, to put this. Uh, when we talk about, as Matthew does, oh, this fulfills what Isaiah said. A sort of old style of thinking is that, well, you have these, these Old Testament prophets and they just kind of would wake up one day and God would just give them stuff. Okay, well, they're they very much speaking for God. And so here Isaiah is at about 750 B.C. and he just says, oh, you know what, a virgin's going to conceive and bear a son and yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but, or maybe he did, you know, it's going to happen. 750 years from now there's going to be uh, a virgin who will conceive. And now it doesn't say his name will be Jesus. Uh, I mean, that's possible. But if, you know, I were to come or anybody would come and just say, uh, I would like to let you know it's going to happen about 800 years from now. You'd say, you know, again, you might be a sci fi buff or something. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, you're not, but that's, you know, fine. You're seeing into the future. But it would be like, well, so, so what? 800 years from now? I'm not, it doesn't, that doesn't mean anything to me now. No, there is a sense in which, yes, in the providence of God, there's a looking ahead, but also Isaiah is preaching with meaning for his own people at his own time. And he says, by the way, he says, and I don't have this up here, but it's on the outline. He actually says in Hebrew, a young girl, the word virgin is not used in Hebrew. A young girl, Alma is the Hebrew term, 
will conceive, bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay? And, okay, now Matthew's going to pick it up later, but it has meaning in a very specific context because Isaiah says, you know what, we need God with us in a real special way right now because we're at war. And I won't go into all the details, but the southern kingdom of Judah was fighting with a coalition force of the northern kingdom and Syria. Yeah, Syria has been in the news a long time. Right? <laughs> so they were fighting. It's called the syro ephraimitic War. There was conflict in all of this. And King Ahaz, whom Isaiah was speaking to, was not real sharp on the uptake. He wasn't leading the people very well. And Isaiah said, look, we, we need a sign from God here. And this... A child is going to be born named Emmanuel. I think the best theory, now we get, don't know this exactly who he had in mind, I think it was likely Isaiah was referring to his own wife would bear a child. Because we do know of two other children, uh, being a prophet's kid was, was not good. Okay? <laughs> being a PK, any generation is not very good. But prophets tended to name their kids as like bulletin boards okay, for messages. Hosea did this. You know, named his two kids, uh, Loami and Lo Ruhama, which would be uh, not pitied and not my people. Okay, you know, on, on the playground, you know, just just call me not pitied. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's terrible. But but anyway, and now Emmanuel, that's not a bad name. But there's also two other kids. That, that these are all in Isaiah seven through nine. One is named Shear Yashuv, which means kind of a long phrase. And then another, my favorite name in the whole Bible is Maher Shalom Hashbaz. <laughs> and that, that was also son number three. And it means something. I, I think they called him Baz for short. But, <laughs> but, 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 yeah, and I, so I think it's just, a, a kid is going to be born and I, I'm going to sort Emmanuel, God with us. And it's not that that kid would be so special in and of himself, but Isaiah wanted in this context of war and conflict to remind the king and the people God is with us now. You move centuries later, 3rd to 2nd century B.C., when Greek rule comes into play. And uh, one thing that happens, this is after Alexander the Great and all of this, uh, the Bible is translated from Hebrew into Greek. It's a major translational book. Uh, the term we use is the Septuagint, and it's identified by the Roman numerals LXX, the version of the 70. Uh, and so you just translate from Hebrew into Greek. Well, anytime you translate, there are always interesting things that can happen. And what we have here is, uh, I'm going to keep pointing, but it's, it's on, your, on your sheet. Uh, it is in Greek that the Septuagint translators say a virgin. This is where virgin comes into the tradition. It's the Greek term parthenos, where we get parthenon and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and young virgin shall conceive, same basic idea. Of course, translating what happened in Isaiah, but now in a different situation, we're under Greek rule, which was fine for a while under one branch of Greeks, but in the late in the earliest part of the second century, uh, Greek rule came primarily from Syrian connections, Syrian Greek. A fellow by the name of Antiochus was a tyrannical king, wanting basically to wipe out the Jews and Judaism and all of this. And so this message would now be heard, God is with us, same biblical message, with though a new context, because boy, we're in a mess now, and God better be with us to help. And by the way, during that, when, when the battle was the worst, uh, this was the whole Maccabean revolt and the basis for Hanukkah and all this. Actually, for a brief period of time, the Jews did experience independence. <laughs> Didn't last very long. But uh, they experienced it, and God was with us then. Now, why did the Greek translators all of a sudden make the young woman into a virgin? We don't know. Okay, good. <laughs> Isn't it logical? You can get a girl of age 12 or 13. Oh, okay, like yeah, yeah, very good, yes. No, I, I like that. I think it could simply be a way of, and particularly in the, in the ideal situation, that would be her purity. And her, it doesn't, actually the phrase, a young virgin shall conceive, does not have to mean that she conceives as she conceives as a virgin. In other words, not in the normal way. She could still, she could be a virgin. I know, <laughs> this is what, like, you know, my my you OBGYN training. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. It could be. We don't know that the translators were thinking necessarily of a supernatural birth. <laughs> 
you could have a virgin who should be a virgin when she is finally joined to her husband, and then they conceive in the normal way. And you could still say that as, although she's not a virgin when she conceives, she's a virgin before she conceives. I, I'm not helping me or you. <laughs> but actually, we, but there's not enough there to know, you're right, that would be the natural assumption, but not necessarily that a supernatural thing, although it could be, because once Greek ideas come in, you do have a few stories circulating out there about Greek gods and human women and all this. I'm not saying that's what the translators were doing. It's just an interesting development in the tradition, but still in a very particular context. And then Matthew picks it up. Matthew's writing in Greek. He's now got the term virgin. That's good, because now it is very clear. Okay, just forget every other uh, mumbo jumbo I just said before that made no sense. But now it is very clear this woman will conceive supernaturally. The Holy Spirit will be the generative one. We now know the name of the Virgin Mary. We now know the name of the Son. And so Matthew is developing that. Now in a different situation, now we're under Roman rule with that whole tradition of exile, but God is still with us. And then... I'm moving quickly here, but it's, this is one of those great examples where Matthew bookends his major themes. He begins with God is with us, and you know the famous last verse of Matthew. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And particularly, I am with you in, uh, in my teachings. Because he said, and we often forget about this. We Baptists in particular, we, love, we call this the Great Commission. I don't know if you all do that or not. I mean, when, when you're a Baptist by age four, if you can't say it and recite the, the Great Commission, you're, just, you're, not, you're not worth much, okay? Because you're to go to all the world and win everybody and baptize, baptize them in a certain way. In the name of the Father and the Son. And, and, but then, but we often forget, we're not through with the Great Commission. Teaching them to observe everything I command you. Actually, the main verb in that clause is making disciples, which means making learners, and is all about sharing the teachings of Christ. Matthew is quintessentially the teaching gospel, but he's saying more than just, yeah, be good little Christian students, but actually it is in the words and teaching of Christ that God continues to be with us. This is living word, it's not just information. It is the very presence of God communicated in this teaching. So you've got a, a lovely tradition here. Okay, I've got two minutes to do the Magi, <laughs> which is not good. And we may, I guess since this is a series, this is what I do in class all the time. I just sort of, we'll, we'll pick up with this next time. And then by the end of the semester where we are now, uh, I'm two lectures behind. <laughs> but, but then we just quit. There's nothing, nothing else to do. So I, just to introduce the Magi, we've got plenty to do with next time. Uh, and the outline is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, the main thing I want to say, and I may just, uh, if you all need to go, I may just steal a couple of minutes and, and make sure you still get to church. Um, the, the Magi have been, <laughs> like so much of Christ, have been romanticized like crazy. Okay? And by the way, this was the primo role. In, in pageants growing up. <laughs> I already joked about the shepherd, you know, I just get a bathrobe and, you know, put, you give Johnny a stick and he's a shepherd. Okay? But I mean, if you were one of the three wise men, you had to have a costume, had a crown and a gift to give, and that was cool. I, I remember one year, so it's very, very memorable. Okay, but, you know, and of course we had wise men and we three kings of Orient are. They're neither wise nor kings. They just aren't in the story, and we don't know how many there were. So it's like, oh, you're just ruining Christmas. So let's just stop and get on. No, no, we sing it and enjoy it. And all. But, but the whole idea, they are magi, which is, uh, that's just a literal, that's just right from the Greek. Okay, they're, they're magus or magoi. They're magicians, not David Copperfield style. But in the ancient world, they're sorcerers is what they are. And they're foreigners from the east. Oh, the exotic east. That's, that's us. The East meant Babylon, Persia, Assyria, Mesopotamia, all the big empires that have whipped up on us Israelites for centuries. Normally we've been in exile in one of those places. So here they're coming from that awful place as sorcerers in touch with God knows what kind of powers. They would be occultic practitioners. Oh, they're gazing at the stars that God gave them. Yeah, well, they're just all, the, they're astrologers whatever that meant. 
uh, at the time, but horoscope readers and all of this, maybe even worshipers of the stars, they're coming from pagan lands. Okay, do, in league with all kinds of occultic sort of powers. So the Bible says uh, all the way through, Israelites are not to have anything to do with these kind of folks. Uh, example in the book of Daniel, which uh, actually is set, uh, at least narratively, in Babylon and then Persia. Daniel was a true wise man. And the famous scene where uh, the, the king Nebuchadnezzar needed a dream interpreted which was wisdom, which needed wisdom. Well, all the magician sources, all the magi of Babylon didn't have a clue. Only Daniel did. And that's typical. Okay, foreign magicians and sorcerers are incompetent. They're charlatans. They're et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that really is, a first century reader, that's how they would read it. They would not be wise men and we three kings. They would be, oh, sweet Lord, these people are coming. Okay? And they're following a star that God gave them. Okay? God doesn't, you know, now God, the grandeur of God is there. But it, it, what you have here in this story, and I'm, I'm going to stop here and then maybe pick up one thing about how really foolish actually these guys are. But, but the main the thing that fascinates me here, and the more that you, you read this, you see again, God is... These are, these are not the kind of people you'd expect that would have a special audience with the Messiah. But this is the big thing God is doing. And God says, oh, well, they, they look at the stars anyway. They don't know what they're looking at, but I'll, I'll give them a star. Okay? Yeah, why not? I mean, God, God's big enough. It's not like, oh, if they go to start worshiping. No, God gives them a star. God reaches out to these kind of folks and says, come on, come on, yeah. It's the stars in the east. Yeah. And they're in the east. Yeah. How does the star lead them west? <laughs> it's a moving star. <laughs> star of world. Star. No, it, it's, it's got, no. Yeah, and, and this is, not, I'm okay, I, I, I wouldn't want to press the astronomy here. Okay, let's not press the astronomy too much. But, uh, okay, you've got me going on the virgin thing saying. before. Now, now, this is not, you, okay. no, no I, you know, you're right. It, it's not a, this is not a normal kind of thing, but God is the creator of the, so the star. Star is moving. Now, actually, I, yeah, I will have to say this. They have the silly star, okay, that would take them, but the first thing they do, this is how stupid they are, and actually it works, you know, it's a silly point, but uh, they go to, the, to Herod and say, Herod, who styles himself the king of the Jews, and they ask, where is he who's born king of the Jews? Okay, which sets Herod off on what winds up being his murderous killing of the babies. You don't go to the present king of the Jews and ask where the next one is, particularly not someone as maniacal as Herod. And they just, if they had just followed the star all the way, they would have gotten where they would needed to go and there wouldn't have been all of this. Okay? Now, we're having some fun with this, but there is this underside, fascinating tension here, with the slaughter of the innocents. And that's only in Matthew, again. And it's like, oh, Christmas is about joy and peace and love and warmth and chestnuts roasting somewhere. Okay, that, that, that's what this is all about. Yeah, but there's a. It's also about God with us in exile and suffering and mess and struggle. And the reason we need the Prince of Peace is because the world is violent and unjust. And at this time, there needs to be as much lamenting as rejoicing. Because, yes, we rejoice in what God has done in coming to us, but we could, you know, it doesn't take anything to catalog the horrible things going on with children, um, well, et cetera, et cetera. There is that violent dimension which shows how much we do need saving. But you have these wise men playing a very, wise men, I can't get these magi playing a very, um, really, a, a very strange role of outsiders and foolish and all this, but God works with all of that. Um, I'll just leave it there. Oh, keep going. On. Thanks. We'll see you guys next week, and we'll maybe do a little more of this. Thanks for your patience.